So we are here to have, we are here for a joint uh, size EIR seminar, perhaps one of the first such seminars we'll have more so in the future. We have a pleasure of uh, having Rogerio Ferres from IBM. He'll be talking about dynamic neural networks for efficient multimodal video understanding. So all the things, all the things that we are interested in, right? Neural networks, video understanding, everything. Uh, so Rogerio is a principal scientist and MIT IBM Watson AI lab, the Watson, I, MIT IBM Watson AI lab is also a manager there. He's done some phenomenal work over the last uh, 10 years or so after he graduated from University of California, Santa Barbara. He has been at IBM for quite a bit of time. Uh, and then his work has been covered in a number of uh, national uh, publications such as uh, the New York Times, all the different media outlets, CBS 60 Minutes, and so on and so forth. So it's a pleasure to have Rogerio. Uh, I'll leave it to him to present his book. Thank you. Thank you so much uh, for the introduction, uh, Vinkatesh. Uh, can you hear me well? Yeah. Okay, great. Um, yeah, thank you so much. I really appreciate the invitation and it's a great honor for me to you know, be speaking here at BU. So today I'm gonna to be talking about some of the work that my team is doing on dynamic neural networks for efficient multimodal video understanding. And several of these works are actually in collaboration with Boston University. So as you know, in recent years, there has been a huge growth of multimodal video data. Here I'm highlighting just some statistics that are interesting. So we have more than 500 hours of video that are uploaded to YouTube every single minute. So if you see the plot here, you can see the growth per year since 2007. And people just watch, love watching videos. So more than a billion hours of video are watched every day in YouTube. So just the video Despacito has more than 7 billion views. And it's not only in social media that video is growing, but also in many other application domains. For example, in self-driving cars, autonomous drivings, we have you know, many cameras for which we can get a lot of video data, but also other modalities like LIDAR. In safety and security, we have cameras that can capture you know, the visible domain, but also potentially you know, the uh, thermal infrared and other wavelengths. Now, many of these applications, they require fast inference, especially real-time inference. The key challenge is that video is very expensive. It takes a lot of computational processing you know, for video analysis, and especially with deep neural network models, you know, which have a lot of parameters. So motivated by this challenge, there has been a lot of recent work on video model compression and acceleration. So here I'm just listing a few models, like the temporal shift module. This was actually developed um, in my lab. X3D uh, from Facebook or, or Meta, which is also very popular. And recent architectures like the Perceiver or other transformer um, architectures as well. Now, the observation here is that most of these models, they rely on one size fits all networks. And, and by that, I mean the exact same set of features, the exact same amount of computation is applied to all the inputs, no matter their complexity. Now in this talk, I'm gonna focus on dynamic or adaptive neural network models for efficient inference. So by dynamic models, I mean models that can reconfigure themselves depending on the input, that can change the computation depending on the input. So I'm gonna start with early work that we did in this space in the context of image classification, presenting a method that is called block drop. And then I'll cover more recent work, especially how we extended this work for video understanding and then to multimodal learning. 
So I wanted to say that this concept of dynamic computation is also aligned with the condi conditional computation, computational concept that was coined by Benjo a few years back. So let me start with block drop. So as motivation, as you know, you know, traditional approaches for deep learning, they rely on hierarchical feed-forward convolutional neural networks, where earlier layers, they capture, you know, low-level features like Gabor filters and so on. And the, you know, high-level layers close to the decision level, they capture more semantic con uh, content. But again, here we have just one single path of computation where the same computation is applied to all inputs. Now, what, what happens if we drop a layer at test time? And by that, I mean, you know, taking the output of the previous layer and passing directly without any computation to the next layer. Now, Andreas Veit and colleagues, they, they have an interesting paper at NeurIPS where they show that if you drop a layer of a VGG model using the CIFAR data set, any layer in the network will cause you know, a significant performance drop, actually close to random chance. However, if you drop a layer in a residual network, nothing happens. So, except for a few you know, downsampling layers where you have a minimum uh, accuracy decrease. And this is true also for other multipath networks like uh, ResNext or DenseNet. So why, why does this happen? So on the left here, you have a PGG model. On the right, you have a ResNet model with the skip connections. Now, if you unroll the recursion on a residual net, then you get this unraveled view of a residual network. And you can see here that uh, ResNet consists of multiple paths. And in fact, in this new RIPS paper, they show that residual networks, they behave like ensembles of shallow learners, where these shallow learners, they, they consist of these multiple paths, which may not depend much on each other. Now, if we delete a layer on VGG or ResNet, in VGG, all paths, they are affected. Whereas in a residual network, only half of the paths are affected. So the flow of information still happens. And it's also interesting that, you know, as you delete more layers, you can see that the error increases smoothly. So you can see here on the X axis, you have the number of layers deleted and the Y axis, you have the error. So here now we are not del deleting just one single layer. We are deleting several layers in a random way. You can see that the error increases smoothly, but, but it still increases, right? So the question here is, can we delete a sequence of layers without performance drop? And you know this would be very important, as I mentioned before, for applications that require fast inference. Because if you are able to drop layers at test time, then you could run the model faster and also you know, be um, specifically you know, tailored for applications like robotics, uh, cell phone, or autonomous driving. So it's interesting that in the experiment of, of VAIT and this new RIPS paper, they basically dropped layers in a random way. In all the same layers, they were dropped for all images. So there, is, there was a global strategy of dropping. And we thought that this could be the reason why the error was increasing when you deleted more layers. So we investigated this problem in a paper that we published a few years ago called uh, Block Drop, Dynamic Inference Paths in Residual Networks. So the idea of this work is to design a model which we call a policy network that basically uh, determines condition on the input image, which layers of the model could be dropped or executed in order to maximize both accuracy and efficiency. 
So this is a collaboration with Zushuan Wu, Tushar Nagarajan, Abhishek Kumar, Steve Rennie, Larry Davis, and, and Christian Grom. So the motivation for this work is if we have a very simple image, like this dog uh, with a frontal view and a very clean background, do we really need to run 100 or more layers or residual blocks of a neural network? You know, if we have just this easy image. Now, as I mentioned before, if we drop some blocks at test time, performance doesn't hurt much. Now, the question is, how do we determine which residual blocks to drop depending on the input image? So if you have these simple images of dogs, then you expect that you would be able to drop many blocks and therefore reduce computational uh, significantly. However, if you have more complex images, for example, these dogs, and some of them are actually bagels, not dogs, um, then in this case, you would expect that you would have more complexity and you would drop less blocks. So our key idea, which we call block drop, is to predict which residual blocks to drop, again, condition on input image in just one shot without compromising accuracy. So the way that we do this is by designing a very lightweight policy network. So this is a very small model, for example, three residual blocks where the computational expense is negligible. So this policy network basically takes as input the image and produces as output this binary vector, which basically indicates which uh, layers or residual blocks of the network should be executed in which ones should be dropped. Once you have this policy, you can just take the image and execute only the blocks that were not dropped or selected to be dro dropped to make a prediction. Reducing the, the width of the network? Yeah, I think uh, for the police network, there could be you know, different options. So here we just use three residual blocks and keeping the same width. Um, but uh, you could potentially you know, e even do better if you, you know, have a policy network that has more depth and decreased uh, width. Um, we, we have an experiment with that, uh, but uh, that could be an option uh, as well. Um, uh, Venkatesh. Uh, th there are recent methods now that dynamically change the width of networks, like um, dynamically dynamic is limable networks, uh, where depending on the input, you can actually change uh, the, the, the width just to maximize, um, uh, uh, you know, efficient. I, I, I don't know if you were talking about the, the policy network, the width of the policy network or, or the main backbone. But if it was the main backbone, then I would link to this work, which was recently published, uh, I think last year. Uh, no, this year, I think CBPR 2021, which is called the Dynamic is Limable Networks, where you can adaptively, adaptively change the, the, the width. But anyway, for the policy network, we, we just, um, yeah, kept it, um, you know, the, the same width, but less residual blocks. And uh, the, the question is, how, how do you train this, this policy network? So this, these decisions, they are discrete, right? So you have keep, drop, keep, drop. Uh, and in order to train that using, you know, just standard back propagation is not uh, uh, so easy. So we basically use policy gradients, right? So given a training image, we run through the policy network, we get this trajectory of blocks that are dropped or executed, and we make a prediction. Once we make a prediction, we compute a reward, and it's actually a dual reward. So we want to make the prediction to be you know, correct. So we have a reward related to accuracy, but we also want to you know, be as efficient as possible. right? So we have a reward that also takes into account the block usage. And then once we have this reward, 
you can use policy gradients just to update the parameters of the policy network in order to um, uh, make a prediction. So we, we, we initially you know, train the policy network um, alone, and then later we fine tune together with the main backbone um, of the model. Just more details about the, the reward. Um, we have, as I said, a training image. We get this trajectory of blocks to be dropped and we make a prediction. So if the prediction is correct, then we would like to get a positive reward. And we can see here that we use one minus the percentage of blocks that were executed is square. So in this case, we have eight blocks that were uh, selected for execution over 16, which is the total number of blocks. And we get 0.75 as reward. Now, if we make a wrong prediction, let's say we classify this as a cat, then we just assign a constant, in this case, uh, gamma, which basically here we can control uh, this accuracy efficiency trade-off. So by varying this parameter, we can actually vary the operating model, uh, the operating point of our model to control this accuracy efficiency trade-off. So we tested this method on ImageNet, and uh, we were able to get about 20 to 36% uh, savings in terms of flops. And uh, this idea is complementary to other model compression techniques, for example, quantization and, and pruning, and could potentially be used in tandem with these approaches. Now, it's interesting to see that uh, different policies, they actually capture different visual patterns. So if you see this pile of oranges, they all follow the same path, config one in this case, whereas you know, these close up oranges, you know, they will follow a different path, which is also different from these um, sliced oranges. And also the block usage, you know, agrees with our perception of difficulty. So you can see on top, we have, you know, somewhat easy images where we have, you know, just a single object, which is, you know, with a simple background, and you know, for these images, block drop usually associates, you know, predicts just that more blocks could be dropped or less blocks in this case to be executed. And vice versa for the images in the bottom, which we consider hard, where you know, we have more objects, uh, clutter, or a more complex background. So those images, they would require more blocks to be executed. I also want to mention that we extended this approach for transfer learning, uh, a method that we call spot tune. And the idea here is to, you know, have a policy network that decides which layers should be fine tuned and which layers should be frozen or shared with the source model. This work was published at CVPR 2019. And later we extended um, to multitask learning where we have, you know, in this case, joint learning of multiple tasks where each task follows a different computational path. And uh, Simeng Sun from Boston University is the first author uh, in this paper. Okay, so let me move now to the second part of my talk where we will describe a method that is called ARNet, Adaptive Resolution Network which is basically an extension of block drop to video. Yes. Is there anything special about making the triggers image? Why not stay those points and maybe Yeah, so the, the only issue is that for block, then, then you would need a, a specific threshold, right, for each layer, which is not so easy to compute. Um, however, you could use gamble softmax sampling, which we did actually in this work that I'm gonna show now, where instead of computing, you know, the, the, the reward and, and um, you know, using policy gradients to update the policy network, 
we are able to using this gumbo trick, which is just a way you know to do differentiable sampling, where you can use just standard you know backpropagation, you know for um, you know backpropagating the decisions of the policy to the policy parameters. So that that could be applied as well, you know, to the block drop work. All right. So this work ARNet is a collaboration with Yuming, Chong uh, Xingling, uh, Ramesh Warpenda, Prasanna Satigari, Satigari, uh, Leonid Karlinski, Audi Oliva, and Kate Sang. So as you know, videos are redundant, right? And and the question is, do we need all frames of a video to make a prediction? So if we have a video or a sequence of frames in this case, where we do not have much, um, let's say motion, like the, the object is static, it's very likely that we could drop a lot of frames here in order to make a prediction. Now, if you have a video where you have, you know, fast motion, maybe possible that you may need more frames because you have less redundancy in order to make a prediction. So the point here is that the decision of which frames are important really depends on the input. In different video segments, they have different levels of redundancy. How about spatial resolution? So most methods, they process all video frames at the same resolution. And here we have an accuracy efficiency trade-off. So if we use like a you know, high resolution for all the frames, then usually we get more accuracy. But at the same time, we have less efficiency because it takes um, more computation to evaluate each high resolution frame. On the other hand, if we use low resolution frames, then we have less accuracy, but more efficiency. Now, the key idea of adaptive resolution network or ARNet is to adaptively select the right data at the right level of detail, in this case, resolution, to make video recognition more efficient. So the idea here is we, we want to select the most informative frames and discard the others to make computational, computation more efficient. But at the same time, we would like to also, you know, determine the resolution of each frame so that you could maximize you know, this accuracy efficiency trade-off. So this is the high level overview of the approach. So here you have a video, which you can think as, you know, samples that are uniformly sampled. And then our method basically makes a prediction for each video frame and determines the, the scale of each video frame. So if you take the first frame, it got resized, let's say, to a medium resolution. And then the second one, you get, you know, maybe more redundant, so you just need a small resolution. And then the third one was actually skipped. So, so you, we, we can actually skip frames as well. In this case, we consider resolution zero. Um, and then once you have, you know, make these decisions per frame, you can resize the frames ac accordingly and compute a prediction for each one of them and average to get, uh, the final prediction in this case, making a sandwich. This is a bit more uh, detailed version of our approach. So we have on the left, uh, this sequence of frames and they are all 24, 224 by 224. Now we have, again, a very lightweight policy network, which receives as input this, you know, 84 by 84 image, which, which is very small. And we also plug on top of the policy network and LSTM just to model, you know, the, the temporal information so that we, when we make decisions, we are also taking information from the past as well. And we just take, you know, for each frame we have after the LSTM uh, and a fully connected layer that will make these predictions, right? Whether the frames should be resized to 168 by 168 or 112 by 112 or 224 by 224, or, or even skip one frame or four frames and so on. And then once we make these decisions, we resize these frames and we pass them to different uh, resolution backbones. So we, we actually use different backbones here where 
for low resolution, we actually use much smaller um, backbones. And this is related to the compound scaling of efficient nets, which, which has shown that you know, for low resolution images, usually it's better to use a, a, a small uh, backbone. These backbones, they produce um, you know, per frame uh, uh, the, the, the action, right? So we, which is our final goal. And then you know, these predictions, they are aggregated you know, by just taking the average. And in this case, making a sandwich um, as the final prediction. And as I mentioned in this case, uh, instead of using um, policy gradients, we use Gamble soft max sampling for training the policy network. And we use an accuracy and efficiency laws as well. So we would like to encourage, you know, to use, you know, low resolution as much as possible or, or skip as much as possible so that we could uh, improve efficiency. So here are, are our results. Uh, I'm showing activity net. In the paper, we have several other uh, data sets. So we compare with several other state-of-the-art methods like, like the bow, uh, add a frame, listen to look, SC sampler, and so on. You can see uh, on the x-axis, we have flops, and the y-axis mean average precision. So the be best is to be on the top left. And you can see that ARNet achieves very good results compared to other methods. And on the right, you can see the policy uh, distribution, which basically tells you how frequent uh, each, resol each resolution was selected. You can see, for example, that for this data set, skip four is actually not frequent. But, but again, this depends on the data set. So if you get a data set that is you know, um, has a lot of redundancy, then maybe skip four would uh, be selected more frequently because you could eliminate more frames consecutively. Here are some qualitative results. So if you have an action like cleaning four floor, uh, you can see that initially, you know, the algorithm decided to start at a low resolution. Then in the second frame, it increased the resolution, and then it was sufficient to make a prediction and just stopped. So all, all other frames were discarded. In the second example, where you have fireworks, the first two frames, they were discarded just because they don't contain relevant information. And then we go into low resolution, high resolution, and then all the other frames, they were discarded. Now, here are some examples of medium and hard cases. And uh, by medium and hard, I mean, you know, uh, videos that took more computation, right? That more resolution, uh, you know, higher resolution was, was selected. Uh, you can see for making a salad, we start with medium res, go to high res, then some frames that are eliminated probably do it to redundancy, and then we get more information to make, make a prediction. In assembling a computer, this task seems to require more resolution, maybe mostly because you have small scale objects. So you have more high resolution selected, you know, for specifically for this video. Yes. So a lot of good things like predictions. So I was wondering how this would work if you have friction analysis. But I think that we'll touch upon my next, um, you know, topic, which is, you know, extending to multimodal, not not visual question answering, but um, actually vision and sound, or or vision and, and optical flow and motion. Um, but but I would say that in this case, yeah, I, I would assume that you you could potentially have a multimodal policy that is dependent on 
both language and um, um, vision, right? To, you know, potentially, you know, se select parts of the video or, uh, or images to, to process. Before that, I just want to, to mention that um, we have also done other work on dynamic computation for videos, uh, which was published at iClear 2021. Um, and I'll not cover these papers uh, here, just want to give the pointers. So v VA RED, you know, the idea is to use, you know, the policy network to predict which features to compute and approximate the others that were not computed with cheap linear operations. And other fuse, we use a policy network that selects, you know, what uh, information from previous frames you could reuse as part of your feature maps. So let me describe now how we adapted this approach to multimodal learning. And this approach is called ADA MML. So this paper was published at ICCV 2021. And uh, it's a collaboration with Ramez Warpenda, Richard Chen, Kwang Fu Fan, Simeng San, um, Kate Saenko, and Audio Lever. So this approach uh, relies on two basic observations. The, the, the first one is for a given video segment, not all modalities may be required or relevant for recognizing a particular action class. So for example, if you have the action running in this case, it may be possible that the commentator is talking about the weather or something that is unrelated to running. So in this case, we have video frames as a relevant modality and audio in this case is irrelevant, which would not be um, useful to predict the class uh, running. The second observation is that some modalities, they require more computation than others. So you may have optical flow, which is known to be very expensive, for example, compared to RGB image processing, whereas audio is much more efficient. Now, the idea of other MML is to predict which modality to use for each video segment, condition on the input, so as we can maximize action recognition accuracy and efficiency. So the idea here is that um, we would like, for example, if optical flow is expensive, maybe we don't need to run optical flow in all the frames. Maybe we can run more frequently the audio, which is more efficient. And, you know, achieving this balance of which modality to use for each video segment to maximize the accuracy efficiency trade-off is the goal of this work. So this is the high level uh, picture of the approach. So we have a video composed of segments. You can think of segments as, you know, say one second snippets. And uh, our algorithm basically would decide for each segment, which modalities to use. So in this case, the first one, you could skip all modalities because they might be irrelevant. In the second segment, you may use just one modality like RGB. In the third one, you might use both RGB and audio and so on. So then you get a prediction per segment and you average the predictions to arrive at the final action in this case, mowing the law. So here are more details. So you can see on the left, you have these different video segments of different modalities. So you have RGB, you have motion, audio. So they are fed again into a policy network that will predict which modalities to use for each video segment. So again, this is a very lightweight model with an LSTM on top. And then the hidden representation of the LSTM is passed you know, through three fully connected layers. Three, because we have three modalities. So each one of these fully connected layers will predict, it's a bi binary prediction, whether that modality should be used or not. And then for the modalities that were selected, they are passed through this recognition network, this sub-networks, which will basically compute per modality a prediction. And then we have the fusion, which, which is just um, awaited some of these scores, a late fusion in order to make the final uh, 
in this case, mowing the law prediction. We have a cross entropy loss, which you know, encodes the accuracy, right? And we also have an efficiency loss, which will, as I mentioned, try to adaptively choose the modalities so that we have more efficient processing. Just more details on the policy network. We used RGB difference as a proxy for optical flow, uh, just to make it more efficient. The input data is subsampled, both spatially and temporally. And we use a very lightweight backbone, in this case, mobile net v2. And again, this is just to make the policy network very efficiently. And similar to ARNet, we use Gamble soft net sampling um, for training both uh, the backbone and the policy network jointly. So here are more details about the loss function. So you can see it's comprised of two terms. The first one is the standard cross entropy loss. And then the second term is the efficiency loss. So you have here lambda k. So k uh, is the number of modalities. So lambda k basically uh, gives you how expensive a modality is. And ck is actually uh, um, you know, a term that is very similar to uh, the block drop that I mentioned before, which just, you know, if you make a correct prediction, you get the percentage of used uh, video segments for the modality k. So the idea here is that if you are using a lot of uh, video segments for one specific modality, and that specific modality is expensive, then you would incur a larger loss. Here are some experiments on uh, kinetics sounds. So we have more data sets in the paper as well. Um, and we compared, you know, with just unimodalities, like if you use RGB only or audio only, we have also as a baseline, uh, the weighted fusion. So in this case, you know, it's just using all modalities all the time and fusing them um, as a late fusion in our other ML approach. So you can see that RGB only uh, you have about 82% accuracy, audio only is 65. When you do the weighted fusion, you get 87 um, uh, accuracy. And Adam ML gets a little bit better, but again, here our goal is not to you know, improve the accuracy, but actually maintain the accuracy without degrading um, uh, with significant reduction of uh, computational cost. And you can see that we actually get um, about 50% of uh, GFLOPs reduction. And in this specific case, you know, audio is selected 94% of the time, whereas RGB is 46% the, the selection rate. With RGB, audio, and flow, so in this case, three modalities, we know that flow alone you know, sits in between RGB and audio, so we have 75% accuracy. And uh, we tested, you know, a policy network with optical flow and RGB difference. And in both cases, we are able to get more than 50% reduction in computation while preserving the accuracy. And uh, optical flow is used about 20% of the time. So here are some qualitative results. So you can see in cheerleading, uh, we have in the first segments, both modalities are used. But then, you know, the other segments, probably because either, you know, you, you are already confident enough to make a prediction or they are, they are not cheerleading anymore, both were discarded. In this example, playing piano, we were able to make a prediction by just relying on audio and just one, one video segment, right? And, and it's natural to, you know, uh, when, when the action playing piano, the, the audio is much more important. In this case, we have a similar example that I mentioned before, where we have a video, but the commentator is talking about something else. So in this case, audio was discarded and you just focused on the video. And finally, an example with optical flow, where you get two segments of RGB selected and two from flow encoding this um, action uh, or motion of chopping wood. All right, so I want to very briefly, um, you know, mention an application that we did a few years back, which is related to this area of multimodal uh, processing, which is 
auto curation of sports highlights. So the idea here is to, you know, detect the most exciting moments of a game using multimodal features. So you can see here in the bars uh, on, on uh, the bottom, uh, we use different modalities like, you know, the, the crowd cheating based on audio or the commentator excitement, uh, the voice tone of the, the commentator. And we also used computer vision to look at the actions of the player. Like if the player is celebrating, you know, you get a more excitement uh, score uh, based on that. We also look at the facial expressions of the player. And then once you have all these multimodal excitement scores, you can fuse them to rank order and check what is the most, you know, exciting uh, moments of a game. In this case, golf. So many of you may think that golf is not very exciting, uh, but I'll, I'll show here one video. Uh, let me see if I can play. Today, down here midway in his... Which in the the, uh, you, you can see the bars, you know, for uh, each one of uh, the, the modalities. Uh, so again, this is an application where Masters using history. several modalities and also processing videos in real time is extremely important. Um, we, we deployed uh, this application and extended it uh, to process uh, tennis. Uh, so uh, the, the system was actually used to produce the official highlights of the US Open and Wimbledon uh, tennis tournament. So it was very interesting because you could get uh, an app that once the, the, the game was over, you could immediately get the highlights according to the player, your favorite players uh, there. Uh, so this, this work was covered by the New York Times and, and watched by millions of fans uh, worldwide, which is cool. Okay, just to conclude, uh, I want to very briefly uh, mention one area that is related also to the techniques that I described uh, uh, in this talk, which I'm excited about. And specifically, I want to highlight uh, the, the work that uh, Samarth uh, Mishra, also from uh, BU, uh, did this summer as part of an IBM uh, internship. And the project is called Task to Seam uh, Towards Eff uh, Effective Retraining and Transfer from Synthetic Data. And the, the idea of this project, the main question is whether we can um, do pre-training without real images, right? And as you know, with real images, we have a lot of focus these days on self-supervised learning and you know weekly supervised uh, pre-training from very very large massive data sets. But these data sets they come with issues um, related to you know ethical issues, uh, privacy, images of people, images of license plates, um, you know copyright issues. And the question here is whether we can do synthetic data pre-training. So we use a platform from MIT, uh, the 3D World platform, to generate all of these um, you know, images of objects with many different simulation parameters like lighting, uh, background, uh, material variation, and so on. And what we have noticed is that different simulation parameters, they affect different downstream tasks in a different way. So it may be possible that material variation is good for one data set, but not good for other. So we propose this approach, which is somewhat similar to the techniques that I described before, um, where we have as input a set of tasks, for example, uh, image classification tasks from different domains. And these tasks are basically mapped into a feature space uh, a feature embedding using, for example, task to, be, uh, task to back. And they are provided as input to task to scene, where this approach basically maps these task representations to the you know, simulation parameters that you could use to generate specific pre-training data sets for those tasks, right? So that, that's the idea. And you, know, you can think about, instead of dropping layers as we did uh, in block drops, here we are selecting which parameters which simulation parameters to use in order to generate you know, a data set that maximizes pre-training uh, uh, pre training and transfer uh, performance. So we got interesting results on you know, different downstream tasks from different domains, as you can see here in the X-axis, uh, using 237 classes. Uh, that's 
you know, the total number of classes of this platform that I mentioned. On the x-axis, you have downstream accuracy. And we consider, you know, several baselines. You can see that task to scene actually achieves, you know, competitive results with ImageNet. In this um, uh, budget of images, 237 classes and 100K images, and significantly better than domain randomization, learning from scratch, and randomly choosing parameters. And the cool thing about this approach is that you could, you know, take unseen tasks and produce in one shot a synthetic uh, training data set for a task that you haven't seen before, just using the learned parameters from task to see. And we observed, you know, similar uh, conclusions that in this case, task to see is competitive with ImageNet and better than other baselines. So just in summary, um, I focus this talk on adaptive neural networks for efficient inference. And I, I presented three main approaches, one called block drop for dynamic selection of layers for efficient inference, ARNet, which adaptively chooses frame resolutions for video, efficient video understanding, and ADA MML, which does dynamic selection of modalities for efficient uh, multimodal video understanding. So here are the references in case you want to um, uh, know more details. And you can see in my webpage other works that we have done uh, in this space uh, as well. So I want to thank you a lot for you know, your attention. And if you have any more questions, you, you can ask. Thank you. Hello, thank you for the talk. It was really great. Um, one, I have a question regarding uh, differentiating through like discrete operations. So it seems like you've used like the Gumball softmax trick, also policy gradients, and also I've seen like, um, like straight through estimation used uh in other works and i'm just curious which one seems to work the best in your experience yeah that, that's that's a very good question uh so i think um uh, my my opinion on, on on this is um you know in terms of simplicity um i would say you know rl uh, reinforcement learning or policy gradients you know they, they are more difficult to train uh, and they take more time to train than Gamble Soft Max. So we, we found that, uh, you know, working with Gamble Soft Max is just simpler uh, than, um, you know, working with uh, policy gradients. In terms of straight through estimation, uh, yeah, so what, what we do is, uh, you know, during backprop, uh, we, we, we are using soft decisions and, and during um, you know, the forward pass, we use hard decisions. We found that straight through estimation is better than, you know, just using soft on, on both forward and, and backward. Uh -huh. But if you were to uh, recommend Gumball softmax versus straight through estimation? Yeah, uh, yeah I, I, well, I mean, straight through estimation using together with Gumball softmax, okay. Okay. right? So we, we, we use both, both okay. together, right? Sounds good. Um, cool, thank you. Um, so um, I'm curious. So for the for the second and third work, um, when you have a multiple back, back, uh, backbone network, when you switch different backbone, uh, what is the overhead of doing the switch? So I can understand that there is a reduction in actual uh, flops in computation, but um, when you deploy it in real system, what is the uh, overhead of doing that switch? Yeah, that, 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 that's a very good question. Um, so there are two kinds of overheads here, right? So one, one is in terms of parameters, right? Because we need to keep these different models in, in memory, right? So you'd say that that's a drawback, um, you know, but, but, but there are solutions for that as well. So there is a recent work called MuchoNet where you can actually handle 
different resolutions within the same model. Uh, so in, in that case, you would be addressing you know, the concern about parameters. The concern about if, uh, switching, uh, the, the reason overhead there, and in fact, uh, you know, if you see our gains with you know, actual hardware, so all, all, all the performance metrics that we use are hardware independent based on flops. But when we deploy on, on GPUs, for example, we, we get less, less gains. Uh, just because of you know uh, you know sparsity and even in block drop right, all, all the optimizations for batches you know they, they are not there um, yeah I, I think here is really you know a good direction is how do you co-design you know hardware to accommodate better you know these uh, algorithms right so co-designing hardware with new neural network models is in, in my view a good direction to Pursue. Got it. Thanks. Um, I have another question. So for the AR network, I noticed that um, not only it is faster, but also it achieve, achieves a higher accuracy. So I can get um, it's, it's faster. It requires fewer uh, flops. But uh, when when we can compare to the previous work, why why you can achieve higher accuracy compared? Because okay, I know um, the the um, probably that's the upper bound of the accuracy you can achieve. Yeah. Um, when when you yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So. Okay, there are two ones. So we, we ask this question as, as well, right? Uh, so first, some frames, they might be just irrelevant, right? And by discarding them, you, you can improve accuracy. Um, so that, that, that's one, 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 one point. Uh, so discarding some irrelevant frames may just lead to better accuracy, right? So that, that's point number one. Point number two is that when, when we compared with state-of-the-art methods, uh, the, the one that we got the best results was, was actually, you know, this is not always a fair comparison, right? Because, you know, you, you have all these methods with different hyperparameters and, 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 and so on. So we, we tested with uh, different backbones. Uh, one that is based on efficient net and, and that, you know, gives you much better results than, than you know, like ResNet, which for some methods, you know, they are based on ResNet. Uh, we, we do have this comparison for both cases, right? Um, the one that I show, you know, on top is actually the one that uses a better backbone. Uh, when we use the same backbone, uh, we, we, we do have, you know, better accuracy than other methods as well, but not as significant. Uh, but again, when, when you compare with state-of-the-art methods, is you know some methods also are based on other modalities like sound and so on. It's, it's hard to make you know a fair comparison um, for the plots that, that I showed. Got it. Thank you. Questions, but I have one more question. Um, so, a lot of this work focuses on efficiency. Um, I imagine, uh, though, that in, in practice, you have some like computational budget. And in the work here, uh, the efficiency is achieved through uh, optimizing some efficiency loss. And I was curious how easy it is to map, like to like, I don't know, hit the maximum bound of your compute budget. So if you, that involves like tweaking loss weights or if there's some constrained optimization or something. Yeah, I think, um, you know, if you have a specific, you know, budget. So, so in, in, in this case here for, for our method, mm -hmm. we, we have these, hyperparameters, right? Like uh, gamma, which is the penalty, for example, in block drop, which allows you to, con you know, uh, do this constraint between, you know, accuracy and, and, and efficiency. But, but even beyond the work that I presented here, there is a class of methods that are called, you know, any, any time neural networks, right? Where uh, you could just, you know, provide the budget that you want as input, mm -hmm. right? And then the method would you know, automatically work under that, um, and 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 that could be trained right to work under under these constraints. Um, so we have some work in our lab um, uh, that does this together with uh, Song Han, um, and uh, yeah, again, the idea there is that 
you would have just one single model that could you know receive as inputs the budget that, that you want to 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 run and then the model would you know just run according to that budget um, thank you Yeah, thank you for the talk. Like, I have a question for uh, block drop. Like, uh, the main backbone is ResNet, which we know that it uh, quickly overfits its training data. And like, the question is, how do we train the uh, the policy and the ResNet together? Because the optimal policy for ResNet on the training data should be different than the ResNet on the test data because quickly overfits it. How do we uh, join the training? The, the, the way that we trained was first we, we got a pre trained ResNet, say pre trained on ImageNet, and we just optimized the policy network, right? And then after the policy network was optimized, then we fine tuned the backbone parameters just with the, the policy that was learned before, right? So this alternate optimization process where it fix the policy and optimize the backbone is, is very common, right? Uh, so that, that, that's the way that we do, you know, this joint uh, kind of fine tuning of backbone and, and policy. And there is no like uh, after uh, any adjustment of policy, you don't, you didn't need to do that, I guess. So for, for the block drop, what, what we did was, okay, you learn the policy, you fix, and, and then once you have that policy, you just fine tune the backbone parameters with that policy, right? So you, you fix the weights of the policy, and, and just fine tune the backbone parameters. Thank but you can do this alternatively. Do you fit on different data sets or like a validation versus do we split the data sets? We so use. I guess these guys are asking this question with like a lot of experience doing these kinds of things. Yeah, we, we didn't. Uh, yeah, I don't quite remember if we split uh, in, into a validation set. I think we use the same training data set uh, to do both. Uh, my question is also on the block job. Um, I was wondering, did you notice any patterns in the dropped blocks? I mean, like several blocks maybe always be dropped together. And also for a single image, is it like possible to have several like sets of dropped blocks? Like like drop uh, this ABC blocks could get the correct answer and drop like BCD could also get the correct answer. And also the further question would be, do you think there's a possible way to, like by playing with those dropped blocks, we can kind of get to know like what the fun uh, functionality of each block, like maybe some blocks can get some different types of features. Yeah, yeah I think uh, the, the third question is, is interesting. We, we actually, we, we're thinking about doing image retrieval by by looking at the, the blocks, uh, the, the, the trajectory, right? Because uh, you, you get a very unique signature. Like what, what we observed was that, you know, different uh, blocks, right? They, uh, like the, the orange examples that I showed, right? Uh, you know, like a pile of oranges would form, you know, a, a config of blocks. And we were actually thinking that because of the blocks, the, the, the block drop policy captured this semantic property, we, we could even use that for retrieval, right? Um, yeah, so regarding the other question about, um, you know, multiple possibilities. Um, yeah, so th there could be uh, multiple possibilities. I would say that either one would be fine, right? As long as you are able to drop, you know, as, as many uh, blocks, you know, wh whether it's, you know, if it's 10 blocks, whether it's in the first layers or less layers, uh, even if there are, you know, possible other configurations, I would say that the most important aspect is, you know, how, how many blocks are you able to drop without hurting uh, the, the accuracy? Um, yes, and then, um, yeah, I think the first question is more about these patterns that related to my first comment, right, on uh, that there is some semantic properties of these paths of uh, executed blocks. Um, you know, for clusters of images, which I think could be potentially explored further for, you know, high level tasks like retrieval.
Yeah. Thank you so much.